Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Very warm welcome to our online service for this service for Pentecost 19. And we begin our worship singing the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and blessed be God's kingdom, kingdom now and, and forever. forever. Amen. We are gathered together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer praise and thanksgiving, to ask forgiveness of our sins, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek God's grace that through Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we may, may give, give ourselves, ourselves to God's service. Return to the Lord who will have mercy. To our God who will richly pardon. I confess my iniquity and, and am I'm sorry for my sin. In, in you, O Lord, Lord, have I fixed my hope. You, you will answer me, O Lord, Lord my God. O Lord, Lord do, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, 
bring us pardon and peace now and forever. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, who has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song will we praise our God. Glory to God in the heavenly realm, peace to his people wherever they dwell. Blessing adoring his praises we tell, gratefully sing of his glory. Then to Lord Jesus our tribute we bring, Son of the Father and glorious King. You are the Lamb who atoned for our sin. Take heed of our prayer and have mercy. For you are the Holy One. You are the Lord, King of creation and Saviour adored. You with the Father and Spirit are God, living and reigning forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, you, you have built, built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Join us together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may become a holy temple, acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job, chapter 1 and chapter 2. There was a man named Job, living in the land of Uz, who worshipped God and was faithful to him. He was a good man, careful not to do anything evil. When the day came for the heaven, heavenly beings to appear before the Lord again, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, Where have you been? Satan answered, I have been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. You persuaded me to let you attack him for no reason at all. But Job is still as faithful as ever. Satan replied, A person will give up everything in order to stay alive. But now suppose you hurt his body. He will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, All right, he is in your power, but you are not to kill him. And Satan left the Lord's presence and made sores break out all over Job's body. Job went and sat by the garbage dump and took a piece of broken pottery to scrape his sores. His wife said to him, You are still as faithful as ever, aren't you? Why don't you curse God and die? Job answered, You are talking nonsense. When God sends us something good, we welcome it. How can we complain when he sends us trouble? Even in all this suffering, Job said nothing against God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to Christ, Christ our, our Saviour. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and tried to trap him. Tell us, they asked, does our law allow a man to divorce his wife? Jesus answered with a question. What law did Moses give you? Their answer was, Moses gave permission for a man to write a divorce notice and send his wife away. Jesus said to them, Moses wrote this law for you because you were so hard to teach. But in the beginning at the time of creation, God made them male and female, as the scripture says. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. So they are no longer two but one. No human being must separate them then, what God has joined together. When they came back into the house, the disciples asked Jesus about this matter. He said to them, A man who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against his wife. 
In the same way, a woman who divorces her husband and marries another man commits adultery. Some women, sorry, some people brought children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples scolded the people. When Jesus noticed this, he was angry and said to his disciples, Let the children come to me and do not stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on each of them and blessed them. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Sometimes the Bible speaks to us at different levels. So when we read it or hear it read, we need to be able to, to discern which level the message is meant to be heard at. Otherwise, we might misunderstand or go off down blind alleys rather than simply following Jesus with our whole selves. Loving God and loving our neighbours should always be the absolute foundation for any life of faith. And missing what level you're reading at could cause you to forget that that is the most important rule and put something else there instead. I'm going to talk about basically three levels. And the Bible is much more complicated than this in some ways, but also uh, straightforward. That God uh, wants to tell us uh, what's on his heart, and he does this in a variety of ways. And sometimes we just need to listen a bit more carefully than others, I think. I'll try and keep it simple to three levels then for now. Firstly, I think the, the Bible is written uh, and tells us about ideals. The ideals that the Bible tells us are things like the way that God made things to be, and also the way that God will make all things to be, and also things that tell us about the nature of God, about who God is. So that's the, the first level. God speaks to uh, the Bible speaks to us about the ideals. A second level that we read about in the Bible is well, what are we reading? Are we reading laws or rules to live by? Now, obviously, this category of, of law or rules includes the law of the Old Testament, mostly written in books like Exodus and Leviticus, but it also includes much of the book of, of Proverbs, I think. They're, they're sort of sub-laws, sort of like little uh, idioms to live by. But it also includes, I think, uh, some of the letters of Paul, because Paul, uh, Paul was writing to try and discern what the best way was in a particular situation. So sometimes people asked him about, what should we do in this case? And he said, we'll do this, which is a law, a rule written for that particular place and time. The third level that the Bible speaks to us uh, is um, tells us how to negotiate and respond to the messiness of the world as it is now. So we're not talking ideals, telling us what who God is and what God, how God sort of made us to be and uh, made the world to be. We're not talking about rules that were written for particular situations or particular times. We're talking about sort of ways and to navigate, the sort of advice. I'm going to call this third way godly guidance. So let's uh, recap. There are three ways. There are the ideals, then there are laws, and then there's godly guidance. <clears throat> and today we have two uh, quite different readings, really, from Job and from Mark 10. So looking at Job, what sort of writing is Job? Is it ideals, is it laws, or is it godly guidance? Well, it's perhaps the oldest part of the Bible, perhaps the first, the oldest story that, that's made its way into the Bible. Um, and what sort of writing is it? Well, it's not about ideals. None of, none of what is written in Job is, is, is telling us the, um, about the way God made things to be. It's not telling us laws to live by. In fact, this um, the, the book of Job is is uh, <coughs> sort of rails against rules. 
later on in, in Job, you, you get lots of his friends uh, and, well, some of his friends appearing and trying to talk to him and tell him why all these bad things are happening to him. And they say, well, you must have broken a, a rule. Try and think of the rule that you've broken, because obviously you're suffering because you've broken a rule. So, you know, you just have to say sorry, Job. And Job says, no, it's not, it's not to do with rules. God knows me. God, God will vindicate me. Um, this, this, you know, this is not about rules, which is uh, interesting when it comes to the Old Testament, because often a lot of the Old Testament actually is written uh, as if it's all about rules. But Job uh, tells us another way. So Job instead is, I think, the third kind of writing. It's about godly guidance for a messy world. Job's is a story not about how things should be, but about how things are, and about the conversations that we have with ourselves when things get really difficult, and about the conversations we have with others, and about the conversations we have with God. It is a messy story with unhelpful friends, undeserved suffering, and a God who for his own reasons, which if we read only the bit that we just read, we can't understand why God would let this happen. Uh, but yet the story, the story tries to bring out something that, that we can learn from it. What we do see, however, is a God who is completely in charge. A God who sets the limits for the ways that we are tested by Satan. And limits also for the suffering. This far and no more. This is a God we want to know. God's defence to Job is in, in Job is mainly this. Well, I am God. I can do I can do what I think is right. Can you do the things that I do? God says towards the end of Job. <clears throat> and through the the conversations that Job has with his friends, and we hear his innermost thoughts as well, I think we are shown how to live. We are given this godly guidance. We see Job who patiently, determinedly follows God, though not understanding why uh, things are happening to him the way that they are. And we also see that God does come through for Job. We see the God who, who, who will make things right at the end. In, in Job, it happens while he's alive. For, for all of us, we, we, see, we know the God who... who will make all things new, the one that we can trust. We see a God who is always with us, and we see God appearing in, in power. And Job, like the rest of the Bible, has to be read alongside the rest of the Bible. When, when we see how God is in Job, that is not the only way that, that God is. God is, uh, appears to us in lots of different ways, but this in Job is what we need to learn. We, must, we need to learn along the rest of the Bible that God's love shines through in other stories, perhaps more than it does in the book of Job. So this story emphasises different aspects of God. It tells us about his, his sovereignty, his, uh, his wisdom. We also can see Job as a, a forerunner of Jesus. Here is Job, a good person, suffering and enduring, and at the end of the book experiencing a, a rebirth and a vindication of his clinging on to God. So that's the sort of writing I think Job is. It's a story to learn from, God's guidance. What about the gospel reading? Well, I think the gospel reading is, is interesting because I think it has all three levels that I've been talking about. The, the Jesus speaking in ideals, the Pharisees speaking about laws, and then the story at the end is, is God's good guidance. The Pharisees come to trap Jesus, it says, and they are looking for a ruling. What law should we follow? It took me a while to work out why this would be a trap uh, for Jesus. Well, perhaps because they had noticed the two things that Jesus is about to talk about, that, and that they appear to be different. Moses gives one law, and the book of Genesis seems to say something else. So which one should we follow? Is one more right than the other? I think this is the basis of their, 
of their um, of their attempted entrapment. Jesus, of course, sees right through it and says, "Well, both things are right. Of course, they are. They're my word." <laughs> um, so they're, they're, what they said was that Moses had written one thing and then uh, Genesis says something else. Jesus isn't at all bothered by the apparent discrepancy. Instead, he points to the two levels of reading scripture. The Pharisees are obsessed by the second level, by the level of law. And so they're looking for one rule that will sort everything out. Jesus, though, says, well, that is a law that, that is helpful, uh, that you can divorce in, in this case. But God's ideals, the way that God really is, is what it says in Genesis. This is the way I made it to be. This is the way things will be at the end, that there will be no division. So Jesus doesn't say what he says about divorce um, where he said, talk, talks about a man committing adultery if he remarries a, someone else. He doesn't say that as a law to bind us all. He says that this is the way things are with God. We all know that divorce in a perfect world would never happen. Well, this is what Jesus is saying. Divorce in a perfect world doesn't happen. It doesn't, there is no division between things that God has brought together in, in, in God's perfect world. That's the way he made it to be. It's broken and he's going to put it back together that way. But we need to be steered clear from the from these laws altogether and live instead in a way that, that honours God in all things. And so we get this last story. And I have to say, I've never really noticed that these two stories are stuck one, one after the other. We have the story of, of the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus about, about uh, divorce. And then we have the story of the disciples trying to stop the children coming to him. And Jesus is having none of it and, and lets the little children come to him and blesses them. So Jesus in this last story gives us the godly guidance that I've, I've been talking about. And that's how we should read it. That we should live as children of God, not governed by endless rules, but instead by the things of the, the sort of perfect things of childhood. Love, wonder, innocence and joy. The Pharisees then ask this question at one level, and Jesus replies by saying, your laws don't make you perfect. Look at God's ideals. He points to another level of holiness, but then says, well, don't worry about the rules at all. Live instead like children. Follow God with joy, innocence and laughter, with love, dependence and wonder. I hope that's helped in terms of thinking about what it is that uh, you're reading, whether it's something that tells us about ideals or about a, a law that is helpful in a particular circumstance, or, uh, or just this is guidance, this is the sort of way to live, or something that cuts through laws and, and looks beyond ideals to the way that we can truly live today with God's help. We come to our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the, the Father, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. earth. I believe in, in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, Lord who was conceived, conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray for your word. we hear those words to us, we pray for all places where there is division. 
where that ideal that you are bringing to fruition in our world is damaged. When we have hurt others and hurt your world, we pray for forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We give thanks for the children of our world, remembering that you tell us to be like children. Giving thanks for their wonder and joy and innocence. We pray remembering how vulnerable they are, particularly children in war zones and conflict places. child refugees and asylum seekers. And we pray for their safety and protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for all the needs of your world, for those conflict zones, refugee camps, Places where people live without food, without enough food and without safe and good water. Without adequate health care. Lord, we pray for equity in these things throughout the world. We pray that the richer countries of the world and the richer peoples of the world would be generous and compassionate in sharing to all people so that everybody would have enough. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We continue to pray in this creation tide for your world and again ask forgiveness for the ways in which we've been inadequate stewards. We pray that our generation would see a change, a very significant change leading to healing of your world. And we pray for this conference COP26 coming up <coughs> later this month. We pray for courage on behalf of leaders and sacrificial hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for the church, Christ's body in the world, that we would proclaim that supreme law of love, love of you and love of neighbour, above all things that we would be discerning in knowing your will for us and for others. That we wouldn't put heavy burdens on the backs of others in terms of laws and standards to come up to. Remembering that you love and accept all of us. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. We pray for this Scottish Episcopal Church, for our Primus Mark, for our Bishop John, for all the bishops. And particularly at this time, we continue to pray for the Diocese of Aberdeen and Orkney. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for those who are sick or in need at this time. And in a moment's silence, we remember those particularly on our hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And we pray for those who have died. We 
We pray for those who mourn now. And we remember those who we love and whose anniversary falls at this time. May all who we remember this day rest in peace and, and rise, rise in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. And we continue our prayers with the words on the screen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let, Let us share, share his peace. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to answer when I call. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to answer me when I call. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to have pity upon her. Make haste to answer when I call. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to answer when I call. Almighty God, we, we thank, thank you for, for the gift of your, your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and in the, the name, name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is A New Commandment.
Lord bless you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon, upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is Christ Triumph.
you so much for joining us again this week and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye. Bye.